Welcome to Energy Unplugged, the go-to podcast focusing on the global energy transition. My name's Anise Ganvold, and I'm Aurora's Head of Research for European Hydrogen and Global Energy Market. Today, I have the pleasure of being joined by Jeremy Bentham. Welcome, Jeremy. And hello to you. Jeremy is the former head of Shell Scenarios and is currently a co-chair and senior advisor at the World Energy Council. So, Jeremy, I know you're doing loads of things besides what I've just said just now. So, do you have a brief summary of what what you're up to now? Well, you're quite right. I'm, I'm in my post corporate executive phase of my life, having retired from that life over a year ago, where I was the head of strategy and scenarios for Shell. And currently, I'm senior advisor to a number of international organizations. You mentioned World Energy Council, but also World Business Council Sustainable Development and Mission Possible Partnership and others, as well as being a non-executive director. Wow, that is quite a lot of things. So I know there are so many topics that we can talk about, but first, I really want to pick your brain on the topic of outlook and models. Of course, those who are familiar with Aurora know we're most famous for our forecasts. And what we do is we try, we try to quantify the energy markets and make forecasts that are useful for people. So I know you worked for a long time at Shell Scenarios. Could you please paint a picture for like, what was the process for making the scenarios? What were the dynamics like in the team? How did you actually go about making those like outlooks, as you call them? Well, great. Well, you know, please kind of prompt me like, don't go into an area that you'd like to go about because obviously it's a, it's a big story. I could go on for hours about this. But basically our purpose was to bring fresh insights to life in the minds, hearts of the very most senior decision makers in the company, but also policymakers and others outside. Uh, and in that context, uh, we had a strong team with functional experts from all kinds of areas, whether that was macroeconomics or international relations, geopolitics, markets, technology, and many of these people were world's leading experts, but they certainly had their own network inside and outside the company to access different perspectives or, or different data. And also, while we cannot predict the future, we can talk sensibly about it. So we did have a quantification team that would take the assumptions being made in developing different outlooks and look at what the quantified consequences of that was. And so a company is basically an engineering company. So quantification is very important. Also to kind of build credibility and assurance when you're trying to help people think better, they have to kind of trust that you've thought of all those kinds of things. And so in our work, the most familiar work is that that becomes published externally. And that tends to be global in scope, multi-decade in outlook. And that contributes not only internally in the company to setting the context in which decisions are made, but also contributes to the public dialogue. And so that's what's felt well known. But a lot of the work was at a more humble scale, and you might be focused on a particular country or a particular type of market or a particular asset. Because this work, whilst it's fundamental, and we can talk about why it's fundamental, is secondary in the sense that it's a means to an end, and the end is making wiser judgments making wiser choices. And so those choices may be around big strategic decisions, uh, but they may also be about still big decisions, multi-billion, but investment in particular assets in a particular place. And that particular decision will have the uncertainties that are relevant in that particular local context, but also the bigger context affects it. And that can be then understood in terms of those broader scope scenarios. Uh, so we had teams of experts in those types of areas. And for the large scope, I would say, you know, typically beyond the team as well, but within Shell, probably 150 people would contribute to the thinking in some way, but outside Shell, perhaps 300, so twice as many 
because having multiple perspectives is part of grappling with the different ways of people are thinking about an issue, which also then reflects in the different kinds of pathways it can take as people make different kinds of choices. So there was that really important aspect of grappling with multiple different perspectives and pulling those together. And you may want to explore some of the things I've said, but I'll go on to say a, a little bit more in a moment about what I call the, the two cracks in that, that I think are particularly important. Yes. I was just about to mention that because you said two things. One is quantifying, which Aurora were very familiar with. But the second thing you mentioned was hearts and minds. Like that's probably something that's a bit overlooked when people are making outlooks not just making a very good and robust and quantified forecast, but also convincing people or influencing people. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that is what I call the second craft. So the first craft is the craft uh, that is kind of visible because it results in something that's quantified, something that's tangible, something you can publish, you can give presentations about, you can speak about in that way. But really... It only comes to life if it actually influences the way people are thinking and hence the way people are choosing and making decisions. And so what I call the subtle craft, the second craft, craft number two, is that social or psychological craft of uh, encouraging senior people along a journey to which, into which they learn to see things differently. Uh, I, I, you know, one of the challenges within that is that uh, most people, by the time they're adults, and certainly most senior people, uh, may say, because this is a mantra from all senior executives I know, uh, we're always open to, to learn, but what you find is they hate being taught. In fact, they resist being taught. And yet, after all, they're mature people. They're well-educated very often. They certainly have got a lot of experience if they've risen, risen to be senior in an organization. And so there is a resistance. So you, you have to make sure that you don't stimulate that resistance. So you have to create learning circumstances whereby people actually are absorbing things and learning for themselves. So there's um, one of my favorite quotes. I slightly misquoted it because it's originally in German, so I'm allowed to sort of slightly misquote it from the, uh, the Austrian philosopher Schopenhauer that new truths or new insights are first ignored or ridiculed, then vehemently opposed, and finally taken to be self-evident. So you're trying to take people along a journey where perhaps at the beginning they they're ignoring you or they think you're, you're ridiculous. Later, they may even think you're the enemy and they're hostile to this, but ultimately they think you're irrelevant because we knew it already. And so you're trying to get people onto that journey to where they know it, knew it already. Uh, and, and that's a journey where you're creating learning circumstances and learning opportunities. Uh, and some of those may be formal, but a lot of them are informal. And so the, the value of what members of my team used to call the Jeremy drip drip approach of kind of mentioning things in, in different circumstances, in one-on-ones, at dinner, over a nice glass of wine, is also part of that process. And you can think about that seriously and systematically, but it is a, a subtle process that if it becomes too apparent, again, is part of building the resistance. Yeah, that, that completely makes sense in what you're like subtly getting buy-in over a period of time through messaging. I should look up that quote because I, I speak German and I grew up in Austria, so I'll, I should be able to pull it out of my hat whenever. Great. So I wanted to stay on the topic of the Shell Outlooks. I was Googling and I found that Shell started thinking about making outlooks like almost 60 years ago. And Aurora is not as old. We're 11 years old. 
But what we do sometimes is we do back casts of our models, which means like we'll look back and say, were, were we accurate? And if we were not accurate, why not? And if we were, then we're going to parade it around. Did Shell do anything like that while you were there? Oh, absolutely. That was, again, part of the continuous activity that was there. And in fact, the Shell models, which I think are you know, very respected and very granular and deep, broad ones, in their development, there was a lot of effectively backcasting, you know, so that you would take you know, assumptions of some of the exogenous areas that, that from a particular period, such as you know, the economic growth in different countries, which is an important uh, parameter within there, and then uh, run the models and make sure that what was coming out was reasonable against what actually happened. And so, you know, there's, there's that kind of ongoing process on the mathematical, the modeling side, but also you know, there's the, you know, the process of really going back and, and taking a helicopter and looking at the, you know, the bigger picture, uh, understanding how the world has played out and has it played out, uh, within the kinds of features of the broad landscapes that you've been developing in the past. Uh, and so, yeah, within that, um, you know, I, I had the ability to look back decades from shell work, uh, but also because I had the great privilege of leading this work myself for well over 15 years, uh, I could look back at the early times when I'd been leading and learn from that. And you know, there's you know, plenty of big things you can say, well, you know, what are the reasons that the shell scenario work is particularly well known was that, you know, it was kind of published in the, the eighties, the experience from the seventies, where some very important set of scenarios had had within them effectively in advance, the formation of OPEC and it wasn't called OPEC in the scenario, but it was a cartel. And there were a number of different scenarios, so it wasn't some kind of forecast or prediction. As you know, I don't like that kind of language in this uh, arena, but you know, what it did mean was that there was an awareness amongst the senior executives in the company of this possibility and people had been thinking about what if, so if this kind of thing happened, what should we do? And so there were, you know political elements to that, but there are also kind of technological elements to that because you, know, you would see, I guess, the very high prices and hence the low value substitutable oil would be substituted, which is a lot of the heavy oil. So there would be imbalances in the, the markets and there would be a call for and an opportunity for money to be made in converting heavy oils into lighter distillates. Your hydro processing. So, you know, Shell do a lot of investment in hydro processing in, in that period. So there's, you know, you know, detailed things like that, you know, but you can also kind of then look through you know, the eighties and see that you know, in this, the scenario where it was already being explored, the possibility of something happening with the Soviet Union and something happening in former, what became former communist Eastern Europe. So there was a preparation for that. And in the, uh, you know, the nineties, there was a lot of work around environmental issues. And in fact, things like shell solar and uh, shell wind energy and you know, shell hydrogen, which I was the early CEO of, were all formed in the late nineties initially that, that those seeds were sown there and, and so on. And so forth. Uh, yeah, a couple of the the examples that that I like that are kind of closer to my my time. First of all, I always have to give a wry smile when I hear it trumped out from the media or something that you know nobody predicted the explosive rise of solar power in the the market. And kind of what they mean by that is that they look back at, I guess, the IEA work and. But don't find it in there. And yet you know, I can look back at you know, shell scenarios you know, back in the early nineties, even in which in the mid two thousands, 
there was already this rapid rise in the use of solar. Now, you know, in those times, you know, there were two scenarios. There was one which didn't happen to have that, but there was one which did happen to have it. You could see how the stars could align technologically and from a demand side that could enable that and, and, and do that. And uh, in fact, in all the shell scenarios since that time, the banding of the scenarios, the actual growth of things like solar power and wind power has been within that, that banding. Uh, now, there, you know, there, there are uh, detailed, granular um, things in there that have surprised. Uh, you know, so, for instance, the rapid decline in the cost of solar wasn't something that was expected to be as rapid as it was. It was kind of expected to happen. And so you know, th that detail was wrong, but it just is a reminder that the pace of deployment of these things is not just driven by cost. It's driven by cost and a lot of other things as, as well. And so that's you know, one example. Early on my watch, we had the dramatic events that were illustrated on September 15th, 2008, when Lehman Brothers collapsed. Uh, and um, you, we went into a, a deep financially driven recession. Uh, and uh, I can't pretend that we were somehow in the months before that saying, oh, there's going to be a financially driven recession. Uh, but we've been exploring recession anyway. And so we had a lot of kind of thinking about recession and recovery. and. Uh, September the 15th, you could see that this was now something serious was going to happen. So by the end of September, we were in front of the executive committee of the company and uh, talking about the recession and recovery scenarios because we were able to go and take the work we had done and then really tune it for a financially driven recession and talk about that. And you know, the chief financial officer of, of Shell I mean, Henry at the time, you know, has done a record to kind of say that, you know, that work kind of really helped the company neither overreact nor underreact to what was, was going on. You know, it, the, the company was better prepared because at the time, many companies were effectively being steered by the latest headlines in the financial times. Uh, and so, the, you know, that was, you know, that was an example, but also, you know, 10 years later, I went back, my team went back, and we really looked through that, and we could see the good things, the positive things that we correctly understood within that framing, but also some of the things that uh, we either hadn't got right, had been shaped by this kind of understanding that you got to be accepted to be able to be influential. So, for example, the rapid spring back in the crude oil price wasn't modeled in what we did. We had a spring back, but not as rapid. So there was something in the dynamics of, of, of modeling, which isn't surprising when you have models that are really looking at the, the trends over the medium term. But also, actually, I remember the conversations that we had where we said, well, in the severe yet sharp outlook that we had, the, there was going to be a pretty rapid spring back of the, the oil price. But at the time, you know, the oil price was down at, you know, like $20 a barrel or less. I think actually some people said he went down, you know, below the 10 or the five, but most, and nobody would have believed us if we'd said, well, you can look a couple of years out and perhaps if we back over a hundred dollars. And so we kind of tempered our message to be able to get over the dynamic, this could spring back without having it dismissed by giving a story that would have been dismissed as too fanciful. I hope that makes sense as well. Yeah, that makes sense in that your, for, your outlook won't necessarily be correct, but it also has to be explainable in the present. Maybe that's what you mean. And then the yeah. Lehman Brothers example, Completely different theme, but it really reminds me of the COVID-19 vaccines where they'd been preparing for it for decades. And then when it came, they 
could just target this particular virus. And now we're starting to come into that point where we're looking back as to what we learned from it. What could we have done better? And yeah, it's an interesting parallel. Yeah, and, and it's on that one. You know, um, so you know, when it happened, people have known for a long time that a pandemic was possible. And, you know, but there was you know, a big crisis in a major organization. Hey, you've got people all over the world. What's going to happen? And so there were crisis teams in the organization focused on you know, all the things that might be needed to be done in the next day or the next week or the next two weeks. But within those, within that main team, a member of the scenario team was there, not because of any technical expertise in pandemics, but because of the, the importance of scenario thinking, a mindset that recognizes that different types of outcome are plausible. And so I was working within that. And at the same time, we were, as the broader team, you're recognizing that this was particularly something that was forcing a big recession based on lockdowns, but that would particularly, be, of course, hit the transport sector, which is an important sector for the company. And so you know, we worked through the recession and recovery from the pandemic work. So we weren't looking at just the, you know, the next few weeks or the next few months, but how could this look over the next couple of years and what impact would that have beyond that? So again, that was kind of mixing those things up. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't realize the, the involvement. So I wanted to move now to the future. So we're talking about outlooks. When I did my introduction spiel at the start of this episode, I mentioned the words global energy transition. And therefore, I'd love to have your thoughts on going net zero or a two degrees world. So at Aurora, we have a central view and we reach roughly 2.4, two and a half degrees warming by the end of the century. Not like a target of the model. That's just what we think is it's going to be reached. But we also have a global two degrees view where we do limit the world to no more than two degrees warming by the end of the century. And that is like a target of the model. So I wanted to know, like, on your views on the outlooks, do you think global two degrees is possible or even 1.5 degrees, or should we stop talking about that? The challenge is urgent and severe. And, you know, it's something that, you know, has been on the minds of myself for more than 20 years, actually, and of the team even longer. So... You know, the team actually produced a film called Climate of Concern in the, in about 1990. Uh, and so, you know, th this has been something that has been around for a while, but, you know, it has taken a long time for the, the public and the political mechanisms in the world to align in such a way that they seriously address it. You know, you know, clearly you know, we're in a period now where it's being seriously addressed, but it's one of those cases like the, uh, the jokes about, you know, well, I wouldn't start from here. No, we, we actually, it would have been much better if we'd started 20 years ago. And in fact, the first shell scenarios that I was fully responsible for as leader were called scramble and blueprints. And those explored the, the most sluggish type of reactions you might be able to accept, expect, uh, in moving the energy system forwards and addressing global greenhouse gas emissions, uh, or the most accelerated path that you might expect. And you look back, we mentioned looking back earlier, and that's kind of what I did very soon after five years or 10 years from that, you know, what you see is that you know, the social political response you know, has been as kind of a sluggish as scramble. And so the Paris agreement that came about at the end of 2015, um, but you know, a lot of people were hoping that something like that would come about in Copenhagen in 2009. So, you know, that gives a sense of the time frame there. However, you know, on some of the techno-economic or, or socio-technical areas, 
those were as fast as blueprints. So you know, the pace of growth in the power sector of solar and wind was similar to the pace of growth in blueprints. You know, the pace of growth in the sales of battery electric vehicles was along that area. So there was a mix of the two, but you can learn from the fact that um, the techno-economic was at the more accelerated side, but the socio-political framework in which that was embedded was on the, the sluggish side. Uh, and so many of the challenges that we face now are still on aligning the stars. Uh, on the uh, the coordination issues, the socio-political issues as well. So you were asking me about you know, outlooks and about how, I don't know, optimistic or pessimistic I am. Uh, so, you know, first on the, on, on the outlooks, the type of outlooks that Shell presents are rooted in what's actually happening now and then explore different futures. Uh, and, but in addition to that, you know, you know, in the last several years, you know, there was the desire to really um, bring an outlook which starts in that way, but which is ultimately shaped to deliberately meet the global aspirations so you can learn from that. And so something called initially the Sky Outlook, and it's gone through various iterations, Sky 1.5, 1.5 degrees C is what it meets, Sky 2050, net zero emissions by 2050, have that kind of hybrid nature in that they're really rooted in, in how the dynamics can really work from now. But increasingly over time, the dynamics are shaped in order to meet that, that outcome. Uh, so in a sense, you know, what I would say is that it is still techno-economically possible to achieve the aspirations. That doesn't necessarily mean they will be achieved. And in terms of optimism, and I don't like to use those terms. I don't apply them to myself. I refer to the thinking of somebody called Jim Stockdale. People who are listening to this or yourself may know of the Stockdale paradox. And he was an aviator who was shot down in the Vietnam War and survived seven years, I think, in the, in captivity in the Hanoi Hilton, as it was called. And a lot of his peers didn't survive. And a lot of them were pessimists or optimists. You know, the pessimists gave up a hope early. The optimists weren't grounded. And very often when they were confronted with challenges, they lost hope as well. But he always held to the fact that an important part of his survival was being absolutely brutally honest about the circumstances that he was in and having an unwavering faith that he could get through this and working to take steps, even if they were baby steps towards that. Uh, and so that may be called you know, positive realism. And so I like to think that I'm a, a positive realist, and I would encourage others to be a positive realists as well. Yeah, that sounds like a good soundbite for, for the podcast, positive realism. It sounded like from what you were saying that the global energy transition isn't just about the actions, it's about perception and how people perceive the challenge. And since you've been working in the energy sector for 40 years, 40 years or so, You've yeah. probably seen many shifts in energy, in like the perception of the transition. What are your reflections now? Oh, yeah. How we see things shapes a lot of our actions and hence shapes the world. So how we see things is really important. And work, like the scenario work, can help people see things in new ways, in alternative ways, in different ways, see through the eyes of others. And in fact... One of my illustrious predecessors used the phrase, the gentle arts of reperceiving. Uh, and so there is something of that in the kind of work that I try and exemplify when I'm struggling with or helping others struggling with radical uncertainties. 
Uh, and so if, if I look at energy and energy transitions, it was really first came into the public dialogue you're back in the, in the early 90s and in a, a United Nations context in which you know, the focus was at country level at which there were deep tensions between the global north and the global south on lots of other issues, uh, a lot to do with you know, financing development and, and historical issues around finance and things like that. And so it kind of got played out in, in that context. And it's continued to be played out in similar contexts as people have understood more and laid out you know, their picture of the world. You know, it's broadened. I'm glad that I was involved in helping shift from a country only perspective into a country and sector perspective, for example. But the, the worldview that's become established is that this is slow moving, it's costly, it's supply focused, it's a burden and it's a slog. And that's kind of not very inspiring. You know, you know, people can talk about, you know, I don't know, three, three and a half trillion dollars of investment required per year. Okay, we're spending a trillion dollars at least already in the area. So it's uh, a little you know, boost on that. But people you know, don't put that necessarily into the context of a, a global economy of $90 trillion per year. And don't work out what this means if you play through the investments into the actual impact that could have on you know, buying a pair of jeans, for example. Uh, and so when you, when you kind of begin to do that and you begin to, you begin to look at the way that developments we mentioned earlier, like solar and wind, explosive growth, battery electric vehicle sales, explosive growth, look back further, look back into the seventies at the, the pace of growth of liquefied natural gas markets when they first started really growing, uh, and you begin to. To, to look at this and you actually see that instead of being this costly slog, another way of looking at this is that it's an high opportunity, fast moving, a set of fast moving, competition driven, modest cost tipping points of uncertain timing. And with lots of opportunities that are there, you ask different strategic questions. So it's not about, should I prepare for this to be fast or slow? It, when the stars align, it's always fast, but you just don't know whether that's going to align in three years or in 10 years. So the question then becomes, um, is it better for me to be a bit too soon or a bit too late. And it's almost always better to be a bit too soon than being a bit too late. Uh, and so the way that we see this is important. Uh, and so whilst there are elements of this, where it's fair to say, you talk about high cost, slow moving slot, there's also an element of this where it's a, a set of opportunity, rich, fast moving demand led tipping points. And that's why I would like to kind of promote that alternative perspective alongside the dialogue that's already in place, because I think that alternative perspective it is right. There's a huge amount of value to be made here that can benefit other people. I mean, I dealt a lot with companies like General Motors and Ford back in the nineties. The Tesla happened and you know, Tesla is now worth 10 times as much as those companies. It's worth, I don't know, three times as much as my former employer as well. So there's a lot of market value being created there. But along with that, if you look at the ecosystem, there's a whole lot of new jobs being created. There's a whole lot of impact on not only, you know, the prospects for a better environment, uh, but actually, you know, the, uh, 
a stimulus of innovation in all kinds of areas as well. Uh, so trying to shift the perspective from this is all about cost into this is as much about opportunity as cost is something that I'd like to promote. And perhaps this little conversation that we're having may help seed that in a few people's minds. Yes, definitely. So at Aurora, we're finding that like it's not just maybe I shouldn't have called it the challenge of the energy transition, but also the opportunities, because what we do at Aurora is also just giving people the numbers to say, actually, if you work on this project, let's say this hydrogen project, you could actually make money. Your IRR looks pretty positive. So it's not a slog. It is full of opportunities. Um, but I'll leave that for another episode, hydrogen. I wanted to wrap up on like something more forward looking or some sort of advice takeaway tips for the audience. I would say that you're an expert on setting strategies, crafting strategies, as you call it, across various organizations and types of types of groups. So what kind of insights or tips could you give to the audience? Because I'm sure many listeners are responsible for or involved in, in setting strategies in their roles. Yeah, that's right. I'm happy to, uh, to talk about that. Uh you know, the word strategy has its roots coming from the word stratitos in, in ancient Greek, uh, which actually meant the art of the general. And one of the, the problems with that uh, is that it's tended to drive a lot of military type metaphors. Uh, but really, the art of the general is surveying the landscape, including the potential future landscapes, almost like taking a helicopter and going up and seeing that, and then zooming down in the helicopter into particular areas that need to be addressed to achieve the, the overall goals that you're trying to achieve. And so um, putting aside the technicalities of, of different tools and ways of thinking you can use in strategy, that sense of the, the art of seeing the whole landscape in a rich way and recognizing that you know, the world is shaped by strong currents. Those always generate countercurrents. You can't tell in advance which is going to be the strongest. So alternative outlooks are always plausible. It's kind of just a fundamental part of seeing that future landscape. But you can look in that future landscape and see that, oh, there are some things that are fairly stable in outlooks. And there are some things that are really critical, uncertain, very different in different outlooks. And there are boundaries to the outlooks as well. So that kind of scenario thinking is an important part of strategy. I'm just going to say a little bit more about the, the military side as well, because uh, something that got me thinking whenever it was more than 20 years, almost 30 years ago, uh, when I was first actually working in strategic areas, there was the conflict in the Middle East called Desert Shield and Desert Storm. And General Norman Schwarzkopf was the, the leader of the allied forces that intervened there. And the guy pushed Saddam Hussein's army from Iraq back, back out of Kuwait. And that was seen as a very successful campaign. And um, Schwarzkopf was asked, you know, what's the secret of success? And he said, and I've I'm not great with his accent, but I'll try and forward. He said, you need two things for success. You need good strategy and you need good character. And if you can only have one, have character. And so that was interesting. And I thought, well, but I did say about both. So what does having strategic character mean? And so I delved into that, and looked at all kinds of examples, my own experience, and around me and building that up over time. And a few years ago, I identified what I think of as the five core characteristics that really make up strategic character. So I'll, I'll run through those. But something that may be helpful for people is that there's a little phrase that I use to help me remember what they are uh, by the first letters. So I remember, so heroes can practice purpose. And I think of a hero like you know, Malala Yousafzai, the um, uh, Pakistani girl who was shot by the Taliban. I have that image in my head, but so heroes can practice purpose. 
So the S is uh, scenario and systems thinking, a way of thinking. The H is humility, and that means to really be able to seek out and listen to and absorb multiple perspectives because you're only going to be able to have that uh, scenario thinking through those different perspectives. The C, so heroes can, it is a number of different things, but it includes you know, curiosity, it includes creativity, it includes courage and commitment. The first P is about patience and persistence. Nothing really important happens overnight in most cases, but a lot can happen in a couple of years if you are persistent. And if you are patient in going through that process, we spoke before about you know, at first being ignored or ridiculed, then fought the enemy, and then being thought irrelevant. Well, you need to be patient to go through that process of, of going there. And then the final aspect, the final P of purpose is exactly that purpose. You only really have patience and persistence if it's something that you really believe in. And so, you know, if I frame my little purpose at the moment is that I, you know, I still feel that I can make a contribution in some way to promoting a better life with a healthy planet. And so that is steering a lot of the things that I do, including the portfolio of activities that we mentioned right at the beginning of the podcast. Okay. So heroes can practice purpose. So I hope our listeners have been taking notes. I'm going to wrap it up there. Thank you very much, Jeremy, for your time. It was a real pleasure to speak to you and get your insights into a whirlwind of topics and hopefully see you on our podcast again soon. Thank you, Jeremy. Anise, my pleasure and thank you very much. That was Jeremy Bentham, former head of Shell Scenarios and co-chair and senior advisor at the World Energy Council, talking to Anise Gambold, Aurora's head of research for European hydrogen and global energy markets. Do keep an eye on our podcast feed for more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. The best way to do this is to subscribe on whatever platform you use. Thanks for listening and goodbye.